system, which we are now having to remedy. Another aspect of the lack of investment in our transport infrastructure over decades, which obviously a yes vote in September can help remedy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government's white paper compares Scotland's growth rate with the growth rates of a selection of independent countries. If over the last 30 years it was proved that Scots would be better off now if we'd matched the growth of those nations, is that a compelling reason to vote yes? First Minister. Yes, is to mobilise the natural and human resources of Scotland to create a, a prosperous and just society in this country. That is the compelling reason to vote yes. So it is not the compelling reason that he had in his own white paper. That is interesting. In the First Minister's white paper, it says that Scots would be better off if you take the period 1977 to 2007. But we asked the Scottish Parliament's Financial Scrutiny Unit to look at the last 30 years for which figures are available. The same comparison, examined over the last 30 years, actually shows that each and every Scot would be nearly £2,500 worse off. So what did make the First Minister handpick the 30-year period from 1977 to 2007 rather than the most up-to-date figures available. First Minister. Well, uh, let's take the most up-to-date figures, uh, figures which are part of the, uh, the GERS uh, statistics, generally accepted, government officially noted statistics, uh, and that shows that over the last five years, the last five years, uh, Scotland would be £12 billion relatively better off if we'd managed our own resources yep. than being part one under the London government. Uh, now, £12 billion is a great deal of money. That could have been used to invest in the Scottish economy, to promote Scottish uh, jobs. It could have been used to, to borrow less, which would have been a, a good thing uh, as well. It could be used to start the proceeds of an oil fund, like our colleagues across the North Sea and Norway have done. Now, to believe that these resources wouldn't have been used to the benefit of Scottish society is the most extraordinary belief. And as that information comes forward in the referendum campaign, then people will see the opportunity to create a, a more just and a more prosperous society for an independent Scotland. Joanne Lomond. Well, that is just so much noise because he didn't answer the question I asked him. And with respect, with respect, his white paper chose those dates. It is incumbent on the First Minister to explain why, given so much of his perspectives, is based on an argument which bears no scrutiny. Presiding officer, the First Minister is asking the people of Scotland to trust his white paper. It has, however, only one page on Scotland's finances and projects forward just one year. It looks back to a period which favours the First Minister's case, when over the last 10 years, the last 20 years, the last 30 years, the overwhelming evidence is we would have been worse off. He says, he says, in his own words, he says we would be £900 better off, but over the last 30 years, by his own rationale, the truth is we would be £2,500 worse off. And that, of course, is where there are figures. Where are the price tags on renationalising the Royal Mail, on transformational childcare, or his high speed rail proposal? No one is suggesting these are bad things, but you do. <laughs> no, even in the real world, Nobody is thinking childcare and a rail link are bad things. We do think we need to know, however, how we are going to pay for them. Every family in the country understands that. So go on. Don't just tell us what you're going to propose. Give us just one, one of those price tags and let's see if it is real. Just one. Yes, uh, no one uh, would suggest uh, that they were bad things. Uh, but on the basis of the school meals vote earlier this week, Labour would have voted against them anyway. <laughs> 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 well, 
let's take any time period that uh, Joanne Lambert wants to take. Over the period 1980 to 2011 12, the most recent for figures, the UK is estimated to run an annual net fiscal deficit of 3.2% of gross domestic product. And the same with uh, our share of Scotland's resources in Aussie revenues. Scotland would run an average annual net fiscal surplus over that period of 0.2% of gross domestic product. So that is the, the last uh, the year since 1980. The last five years I have already given uh, Joanne Lamont. The last figures we have available, uh, the relative fiscal surplus of Scotland in 2011-12 was £4.4 billion or £824 pounds per head. That is the amount we would be better off if Scotland had been running its own uh, resources. Now, Joanne Lamont says that she does not think that the White Paper is ambitious enough, particularly on things like childcare. Well, the White Paper is ambitious because it wants to transform childcare in this country. Yeah. That would cost, in the parliamentary terms, £700 million. The White Paper argues that that can come about because of the revenues that grow from increasing female participation in the workforce by 6%. If we stay within the United Kingdom, we will never be able to afford that because the money will go to George Osborne and the London Treasury. And believe me, he is not thinking of giving extra money to Scotland. He, like Margaret Thatcher before him, is working out how to take money away from Scotland, as long as nobody finds out. First of all, if we are going to look at the vote this week, we presume, therefore, that the SNP government did not want to see transformational support for childcare because they voted it down. <laughs> secondly, secondly, whatever figures he quotes there, he is now no longer defending his own approach, which justified supporting independence in his own white paper. I did not say that the challenge for the white paper was not, it was not ambitious enough. What I said was it does not match its claims with any figures to make it credible and believable. He did not answer the question on prices. So what the government can't price, the parliament can. It's £1.16 million billion for the Royal Mail. £1.2 billion pounds for childcare, but no explanation of how they will be paid for. And the rail link, even Spice can't price that. So for those of us living in the real world, a shopping list without a price list is just a wish list. And by the First Minister's own figures, we would have even less money to spend on these things. The First Minister asked for us to publish an alternative to his white paper. Is not it the case that the real alternative to the white paper is called the truth? First Minister. Oh dear. Oh dear. Order, First Minister. Right. Let, let's see if we can try again on, on childcare. The White Paper outlines the first parliamentary term, a transformation in childcare, 1,100 hours for three- and four-year-olds, which we believe will increase female participation in the workforce eh, by 6%, bringing us to Scandinavian levels. We point out that that will release to the Scottish Exchequer £700 million, because as people come back into the workforce, they pay income tax, they pay national insurance, they pay VAT, and that fund will accrue to the Scottish Exchequer. Right now, it goes down to London, which is why, under a fixed budget, it is difficult to afford these things. Now, do you Anne Lamont should know that because she put forward an amendment which could not be afforded earlier this week. Yeah. She put forward an amendment costing £100 million when there was not £100 million available in either year for it. So, in order to try and finance it, she then said she would not go ahead with free school meals. She would deprive the people of Scotland yeah. of free school meals in yeah. primary yeah. one yeah. to three. Yeah. Now, a, a lot of us. And therefore, I haven't even mentioned the cuts in business rates, but they were overtaken by Ian Gray denying it. Now, a lot of us think that was a fundamental mistake by the Labour Party, which will cost them dear. Now, I accept when I say, and I look at the blank faces in the Labour back benches, how worried they were about the votes on Tuesday. When I say it, of course, I'm partial. So let's have an impartial commentary. Beside this win-win situation, Scottish Labour leader Joanne Lamont still opposed the move on school meals. 
Labour now find themselves opposing a move welcomed by just about anyone with anything to say about education and the eradication of poverty. They are now at loggerheads with charities, campaigners like the Teaching Union, the SDUC, Unison, Save the Children, not to mention the Child Poverty Action Group. That is the daily record editorial from yesterday, which just about sums up the something for nothing position of Joanne Lamont. Question number two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he will next meet the Prime Minister. First well, Minister. Well, not in Scotland by, by the sound of it, because he's, <laughs> he's too posh and he's too unpopular. Ruth Davidson. I thought the, uh, I thought the Prime Minister's performance yesterday showed a a humour and a self-deprecation that seems wholly foreign to the First Minister, and perhaps he could take note. Uh, but, Presiding Officer, this week we learned that the head of Historic Scotland left her post after just 30 months with a £300,000 payoff plus pension. This is a huge amount of public money, and it comes straight from the Scottish Government's coffers. So can the First Minister tell me which if any of his ministers cleared such a payment? First Minister. Well, the agreements in terms of settlement and compromise agreements are settled in the normal way by the civil service. They are not a matter of political discretion. They are a matter of the management of the civil service, as with any other responsible organisation. And I am absolutely certain that Ruth Davis is not going to seriously argue that, that ministers uh, should interfere in a political sense uh, in matters such as that. Ruth Davidson. Well, I take it from that that the, the First Minister says that no minister of his government did sign off this deal, nor should have. But why? Because the rules on this are pretty clear. Those rules, as published by the Scottish Government itself, state, and I quote, ministerial clearance must be obtained in relation to any potentially high-profile cases. Now, by any definition, a Quango chief being given a £300,000 payoff after just two and a half years in the job is a very high-profile case. And it's one of a long list of payoffs which has cost this country £56 million pounds in just the last two years. Order. So the Scottish taxpayer is footing the bill for these extravagant golden goodbyes, and they are entitled to some straight answers. So why? Given the rules, with this payoff not approved by a government minister, who did approve it? And does the First Minister really believe? that anyone who voluntarily leaves a job after just 30 months should be walking away with £300,000 of taxpayers' money. First Minister. The settlement uh, agreed within the civil service would be the facts and circumstances of the case. The only justification would be for ministerial intervention if there was something seriously wrong with the process which had arrived at that. No, the reason for Order. ministerial intervention would be if there was a partiality. Now, I, I take one point that I can say to Ruth Davidson, which maybe illustrates the dangers of, of raising uh, staff matters and personnel matters uh, in this format. She is perfectly entitled to do so, but there is a danger. She referred uh, uh, and gave the impression that, that the individual concern had been imposed for a short period of time. She ignored the fact, as my understanding is, that she had worked for well, a generation within the, the, the civil service. And you don't just look in these circumstances necessarily at the latest posting. That is why these decisions, these Agreements and compromise agreements are best done in best personnel practice, and with great respect, whether it is a, a ministerial political intervention or, for that matter, a, an opposition political intervention, that is not, in fairness and natural justice, the way that th such things should be conducted. Question to question, Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the news this week that administrators have been unable to find a buyer for the Orkney based jewellery company uh, Ortac. As a result, around 115 jobs are under threat, including more than two dozen in my own constituency. I am very grateful to the Enterprise Minister and HIE for their cooperation over recent days. But can I ask the First Minister to confirm that every effort will be made to give the staff affected all the support they need? And will he also agree to facilitate any reasonable bid to take on some or all of the vitally important manufacturing? Uh, roles currently based at the Hatston Estate in Kirkwall, Orkney. First Minister. Yeah. Can, can I say to the constituents of the member that the, the answer is yes to, to both questions? And as he acknowledged in his question, Fergus Shewing has been deeply involved in this case, uh, and every effort will continue to be mobilised to get a more satisfactory outcome. And any 
uh, concerns or ideas or initiatives that the constituency <coughs> member wishes to make, and Fergus's door will be very open uh, to any of these suggestions. But I am glad he acknowledged the efforts of the industry minister, and the answer is yes to both parts of his question. Neil Findlay. Uh, thank you, President Officer. In today's Herald newspaper, we read of the case of consultant psychiatrist Dr Jane Hamilton, a doctor at St John's Hospital in my region. Dr Hamilton has bravely, bravely spoken out about the attempt by her employers to gag her from raising concerns about the care being provided to women in the unit where she worked. <coughs> Excuse me. Dr Hamilton has written on several occasions to the Cabinet Secretary for Health, asking him to independently examine her case, but to date this has been declined. Will the First, First Minister step in in this case, and will he condemn the use of gagging clauses in cases where NHS staff are raising concerns about patient care and safety? First Minister. Uh, can, can I point out two things? Uh, there already has been, and this is you know, the, the heart of the issue for, for people, there, there has been an investigation, an independent investigation into that unit. Uh, that was uh, taken forward by Dr Margaret Oates, the consultant uh, psychiatrist at Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Trust. It was reported in 2012. Now, I won't go through to Neil Finlay the, the full range of the findings of that investigation, but suffice it to say there were an extremely a satisfactory report on that independent investigation. So there was an independent investigation that took place uh, with a, a consultant uh, a physician of high standing uh, out with the, the, the Scottish National Health Service. Uh, and that found, for example, that the mother and baby unit was staffed by clinicians with expected level of specialist knowledge and skills. There was no evidence to support the allegations that the mother and baby unit and the community service were dangerous, unsafe or dysfunctional. So there has been an independent investigation. Now, in terms of the, the question on gagging orders, uh, I think it's what should be understood. Uh, and the, the Health Secretary has been absolutely explicit. I mean, he wrote to health boards on the, the 22nd of February last year that confidentiality clauses are not to be used to suppress reporting of concerns about practice in NHS and Scotland. Uh, and it's really important that I, obviously, I can't comment on this individual compromise agreement. Uh, but NHS Lovian have made it clear that they explicitly refer to the protected issues that is in a compromise. Well, Neil Finlay shakes his head. Unless he has actually seen that compromise agreement, he should not dispute this. Because NHS Lovian have said that the protected issues are explicitly referred to in any a compromise agreement. That is to say, concerns about patient welfare, uh, bullying or other aspects in the National Health Service. Now, if that is the case, and that is explicitly within a compromise agreement, then I am sure uh, that Neil Finlay will be satisfied. I will ask the Health Secretary to look, if he can, and these matters obviously are a matter between, uh, between the individual and health board, to look to make sure that there is such an explicit reference to what is protected by law in, in terms of what people are able to say. And if that is in the confidentiality agreement or could be expressed differently or whatever, then I hope Neil Finlay will be satisfied. But I do not think he should dispute that unless he actually knows that such an explicit reference is not contained within the compromise agreement. I will ask the Health Secretary to check that matter and report back to Neil Finlay. Question 3, Margaret Mint. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to deal with perpetrators of serious sexual offences. First Minister. Well, we strengthened the law considerably uh, around sex crimes by bringing in the, the Sexual Offences Scotland Act of 2009, modernising the law for, uh, for Scotland. We have strengthened the Scotland Sexual Offences Prevention Order, Risk of Harm Order regimes, allowing the imposition of positive obligations were deemed appropriate by the courts. The current Criminal Justice Bill, of course, would seek to remove the routine requirement for corroboration, which can be a particular barrier, as the members should know, to the prosecution of sexual crime. The Crown Office has developed a, a team of expert prosecutors in the National Sex Crimes Unit, which specialises in the investigation and prosecution of serious sexual crimes in Scotland. And Police Scotland has uh, improved the investigation of rape and other sexual crimes, setting up the new National Rape Task Force, the Rape and Sexual Time External Advisory Group, and that's designed to inform and improve the investigation of rape. Now, I think uh, when Margaret Mitchell considers that range of initiatives that have been taken, then she can see that this government and its term of office have treated this hugely serious matter extremely seriously. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, I thank the, uh, the First Minister for that comprehensive response. Serious sexual offences are amongst the most heinous which can be committed. The traumatic effects on the victim can last a lifetime. The First Minister believes that the abolition of co uh, corroboration will help tackle the problem. A host of experts, uh, expert opinion disagrees. 
What can't be disputed, however, is that abolition of corroboration won't help the low conviction rate in serious sexual offence cases which do come to court, as these cases have already met the corroboration threshold. I therefore ask him today to support the introduction of a pilot scheme for independent legal advice for rape victims at the point when sensitive medical and personal information is requested. As an amendment to the Victim and Witness Bill, I propose such a pilot based on research carried out by Rape Crisis Scotland, who found that the majority of victims Can are Can we just unaware. get a question, Ms Mitchell? Coming to the question uh, now again, um, Presiding Officer. This means totally irre irrelevant information is used to discredit the victim and um, decrease the chances of a conviction. So whilst the debate on corroboration continues, will Mitchell, the First Minister the act question. now and introduce a similar pilot estimated to cost only 20000 to help tackle conviction rates. First Minister. Well, I'll ask the Justice Secretary to look seriously at uh, that suggestion. Can I uh, say to Margaret Mitchell, though, that she's wrong to suggest that the argument for corroboration changes it is based on increasing the conviction rate? The Lord Advocate said that explicitly, as she must know, uh, at the committee. The argument is that many cases don't get into court because of the general law of corroboration. And an example would be uh, Murdo Fraser's uh, claim just before Christmas, uh, demanding to know why a serious offence was not prosecuted in Scotland when the Crown Office had already made it clear because the general rule of corroboration made it insufficient basis on which to pursue a prosecution. And that's why, if you're going to be taken seriously about these matters, then you cannot have a situation where cases can't come to court because of the general rule of corroboration uh, and then say, look, there's something that has to be done uh, about making sure there's justice for rape victims in Scotland. You've got to square the two things. Question four, Bob Doris. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the potential impact on the Scottish economy of a reported additional £25 billion reduction in spending planned by the UK Government. First Minister. Well, we'll be making a, a, a very uh, serious examination of this latest threat from uh, George Osborne. Well, the, the Tory party don't have any idea about it because their spokesman on television last night couldn't give any idea whatsoever of what would happen with a further £25 billion cuts uh, in public uh, spending. So we'll do a, a serious examination of that. And it does say that the choice facing the people of Scotland is clear between no campaign's obsession with austerity and this government's vision founded on a nation with the principles of fairness and prosperity. prosperity. For that answer, one suggested Tory attack on vulnerable Scots is to discriminate against young people by withdrawing housing benefit altogether from under 25, something that I believe an independent Scotland would never consider. Can I ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government can make of the potential impact of this Tory plan could have on young Scots, including 5,200 under 25s in Glasgow that I represent and nearly 33,000 across Scotland that rely on housing benefit? And will we make urgent representations to the UK Government opposing these plans, which, along with the UK Government's bedroom tax, will only lead to further poverty, fuel family tensions and exacerbate homelessness? First Minister. Well, we're deeply concerned uh, about this latest threat to the welfare system and the effect that this measure could have uh, on over 30,000 under-25s who currently received housing benefit in, in Scotland. Uh, and let's remember that the rationale for the bedroom tax for the attack on housing benefit has been the runaway costs of, of housing benefit in the high-pressure housing areas of the, the south-east of England. It wasn't the position within the housing benefit in Scotland uh, that led to this assault. So we'll continue to support people in Scotland who are suffering from these repeated cuts to, to welfare benefits in the, the measures that we have taken. But I hope that all people in this chamber, if indeed this comes to pass, if indeed this threat uh, to housing benefit the under 25s, people who don't believe that we should control, not that we could, which doesn't seem to be in dispute, but we should control the welfare system in Scotland, might have cause to change their mind in 2014. Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, did the First Minister see the article by uh, Liberal Democrat Tavish Scott uh, in The Scotsman today, which said that uh, George Osborne's £25 billion mistake will seal the fate of the Conservative Party and hasten the election of a Labour government? <laughs> given, given that his uh, whole referendum strategy is based on having a Tory government in London, yep. How will he scare the Scottish people when they are faced with the prospect of a Labour government that will boost employment, freeze energy prices?
and provide the resources for a massive expansion of childcare. First Minister. Well, you see, Malcolm, okay. Malcolm, Malcolm and I have been around politics for a long time. You see, we have been around long enough to, to remember Malcolm's resignation from a Labour government when he was a minister <laughs> because they were attacking benefits to single parents. I, I think he lasted about a year before he realised that his dreams had been betrayed and he had to go <laughs> into a resignation. But in terms of sealing the fate, let's say this. The Liberals' fate is already sealed. So Tavish, <laughs> Tavish got forecast of the sealing, the, the Tory fate, it should be taken seriously because he's speaking from personal experience in his party. But the Labour Party's fate will be sealed by Ed Ball's reaction to the 25 billion cuts, which wasn't to say there shouldn't be. It was to say, yes, Labour will do that as well. We'll just make different cuts. Maybe at some point you'll tell Malcolm Chisholm what these cuts are going to be, and then Malcolm Chisholm will have to resign again. Question number five, Kesha Dugdale. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government considers that schools, pupils and teachers are adequately prepared for the new National 4 and 5 qualifications. First Minister. Well, yes, the, the Scottish Government, Scottish Qualifications Authority, Education Scotland and others have decided on unprecedented levels of support for curriculum for excellence and the new qualifications. That includes more than £5 million of additional funding, two extra in service days to help pe teachers prepare for the new qualifications, full course materials for each of the 95 national four and five courses, and specific events for thousands now of teachers. That said, we always stand ready to help provide more help if needed to ensure that the new qualifications are delivered successfully. President Officer Alan McKenzie from the Secondary Teachers Association told the Edinburgh Evening News this week that teachers lack confidence in the SQA, that there's complication and confusion around verification, assessment demands are impossible to adequately meet and there's a continuing lack of support materials. He says it would be quite wrong to dismiss proposals as simple anxiety or ritualistic moaning. For the sake of all the young people in Scotland facing these exams and the future of a radical reform of the curriculum which these benches started. Will the First Minister recognise these concerns and take immediate action? First Minister. Well, nobody has dismissed any concerns. In fact, I heard the Minister say exactly the opposite. That's why this unprecedented level of support has been put in place. Uh, but I mean, Ken Cunningham, the General Secretary of School Leader Scotland, has said the preparation consultation has been more than I can ever remember. The amount of effort that's gone into this knocks the others into a corner. And that's a quote from the 3rd of January this year. Now, I'm interested <laughs> in, the, uh, in the position of Kezia Dugdale quoting teachers' unions, if only they'd listened to the teachers' unions and decided to support free school meals for primaries one to three. Mary Scanlon. Dr. Callan McKenzie of the Scottish Teachers Association also said, for the sake of the young people of Scotland and the future of a radical curriculum reform, please listen to us and let us work together to fix the problem. Will the First Minister adhere to these pleas? Will he listen to teachers? Will he help fix the problem and give pupils in Scotland the chance they deserve to get qualifications, educational training and into employment? First Minister. Right. We will continue to listen to teachers to ensure they get further help if needed and any issues are addressed. That was Alistair Allen, the Education Minister, speaking this week on the radio. I think that answers the member's question. Question six, Claire Adam. Thank you, Presiding <coughs> Officer. To ask the First Minister what plans the Scottish Government has to increase childcare provision. First Minister. Well, as I announced in the Chamber on Tuesday, we will increase the uh, number of two-year-olds uh, and start the process of expanding childcare uh, among two-year-olds approximately to 15 per cent of the total and then to 27 per cent of, of two-year-olds uh, in August 2015. Uh, I'm interested in that. It's about 15,000 children. Uh, that's an ambitious plan and, of course, it goes beyond the demand and claim from the Labour front bench of 10,000 children. Yes, so in your case, Radio Clyde, Kezia Dugdale and Joanne Lamont in this chamber, 10,000 children. We're expanding to 15,000 children in the measures that were announced on Tuesday. And I'm sure that uh, right round the chamber, in their heart of hearts, will give that as warm a welcome as Willie Rennie so graciously did on Tuesday. Claire Adamson. Thank the First Minister for his answer, but does the First Minister agree that when Save the Children, the EIS, Unison, Shelter, the Church of Scotland and the Child Poverty Action Group all say free school meals are a key measure in tackling child poverty, politicians of all parties should listen? First Minister. 
Well, uh, I already quoted the, the Daily Record. They're absolutely right. I think the Labour Party at this stage should just accept there is a broad coalition of people interested in the welfare of children in Scotland who support the free school meals. And sooner rather than later, they're going to have to totally reverse their position, except they were wrong this week. If they don't do that, then the damage done to the Labour Party at grassroots level in Scotland will approach that that was done uh, by the bedroom tax uh, and other measures, but perhaps will only be compared with their alliance with the Tory party in the referendum campaign. So, can I say to Joanne Lamont, in the position she's in, which is a ridiculous position, for goodness sake, reverse what you did, apologise for the votes against on Tuesday, and get behind the broad coalition of backing the children of Scotland. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move on to members' business. Members who are not participating in this debate should leave the chamber quickly and quietly.